Smile, everybody. And we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 12th installment of our virtual astronomical outreach programs. My name is John Lederbach Vega, and I'm the outreach director for the Riverside Astronomical Society. And I will be one of your co-hosts tonight. And I am not a professional astronomer by any means, but I have enjoyed astronomy and been fascinated with it ever since Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon when I was nine years old. Our other co-host, Sunan. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, and good night, depending on where you are on the globe. My name is Sunan Du, and I am uh, uh, in charge of public outreach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. Um, I am a professionally trained astronomer, and I study galaxies that are really, really far away from us. Although we'll not be looking at them uh, tonight, I am very excited to um, take you on a tour, all of us, um, on uh, exploring different planets and also the moon in the solar system. We are very excited to be able to continue this partnership with the Riverside Astronomical Society. And it's amazing just to think about that we have been running this program for almost a year and a half. So, John? Yeah, so we're gonna be looking, our theme tonight is the solar system. Oftentimes, if you've been following us in the past, we've been going out deep into the Milky Way galaxy or even beyond the Milky Way galaxy. But tonight we're staying close to home. We're gonna look at lots of different planets, checking out the moon. And the images we're gonna be able to share with you are pretty cool. But if you're only watching us on your phone, it won't be as cool as it could be. So if you can get us on a bigger screen tonight, you'll be glad. And uh, next I will introduce our lovely volunteers tonight with us who will be moderating the chat that you can see on the right-hand side of the YouTube page. Um, I will let them to introduce themselves, uh, Jess. Hi, um, I'm Jess Stoffel. I am a PhD candidate here at UCR studying globular clusters, and I am very excited to be answering all of your questions tonight. Thanks, Jess. Um, next, we have Garrett. Hi, everyone. My name is Garrett. Um, I'm, a sec I'm going to be a third year uh, PhD student at the University of California, Riverside. I'm located in Riverside, California right now, um, and I study the early universe and dark matter. Um, hope you enjoy the show. Very cool. Thank you, Garrett. Yongda. Hello everyone, I'm Yungda. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Riverside studying the early universe. I'm very happy to answer your questions. Please enjoy our show. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next is Ming Fong. Hello everyone, I'm Ming Fong. I'm fourth year PhD candidate here at UC Riverside and I study machine learning in um, astronomy and cosmology. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Cheryl. Hi. I am a UCR graduate, a retired middle school teacher, and a member of the outreach uh, group with the Riverside Astronomical Society. Happy to answer your questions today. Thank you all. Um, so the other telescope operators will introduce themselves when it's their turn uh, during their presentation. Um, in the chat, we welcome all kinds of questions and would also encourage you to engage in discussions. Um, since we're expecting a relatively large group tonight, uh, we kindly ask you to be respectful to the others in the chat. Uh, most of the questions will be answered by uh, the chat moderators who just introduced themselves. And the, the remaining questions will be relate to the panel uh, to be answered throughout this event. And also, if you have a younger audience with you and they have questions, feel free um, to put their name and especially age in uh, the chat so that we could pick on um, those kind of questions and try to explain it in a more understandable way. Um, so this is our 12th stargazing event. We are super grateful for um, all the support from those of you who have already been with us for a while, and we're also super excited to see all the new participants here. We would certainly love to hear how you think about this program, 
um, and we'll also be collecting feedback after this event um, so that we could keep improving and providing more shows uh, that are of your like. Um, in the end, we will also be doing a raffle. And uh, John, would you like to show what the, the raffle looks like? Yeah, so we've got this book. It's called Touring the Universe by Ken Gron. It's a nice spiral bound, substantial book. It's not just, it's like on Amazon, it was like $35. You can get it for free here with us. It's awesome. That's great. And we wish you best of luck if you are still staying with us um, at the end of the show. Um, at that point, we'll share a Google link for you to enter yourself um, into the raffle and we'll contact you if you win. Um, so lastly, we want to thank all of you, especially those um, who are not in the United States, uh, because it could be a very late or early time for you. So thank you for being here. And without further ado, let's get started. All right. And I forgot to tell you, I am in my home tonight in Riverside, California. It only looks like I'm out in space. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to go outside with our telescopes and get this party started. We're gonna go and check out the brightest thing up there. You're gonna look at that and swear it's an airplane coming to land on your front lawn, but it is not an airplane. It is, well, I'm not even gonna tell you what it is, but Brian will. Brian, take it away. Yes, thank you. I'll get this started here. I agree, let's get this party started. Hi, I am Brian Cox. I am with Riverside Astronomical, and this is a live view of Venus. I'm just going to adjust my screen here just a moment before it moves out of view. I've highly magnified this such that even my telescope can't quite track it. <laughs> now, Venus technically is the second brightest item in the sky after the moon tonight, but it's also second from the sun. And Venus is a quite amazing planet. Now, you may be saying, hold on just a moment, Brian. This is some horrible image of the moon, not Venus, because it's like half lit like a phase of the moon. Well, we're here to tell you that Venus actually has phases. Now, if you take a look at this picture, this is Earth, this is the sun, and you see over here to the left, this is actually where Venus is in its orbit. So you could see it is lit on its side. And that's why Venus has phases. Now, throughout Venus's orbit, it will actually adjust from a little tiny crescent to almost fully illuminated. So take a look with your binoculars or telescope throughout the year at Venus and you'll see these phases. Now, more about this amazing planet. By the way, Venus is ridiculously low in the sky, which is why it's such a wobbly picture. The atmosphere is really wreaking havoc with the light just like a water shining, I said, just as light shines through water, it starts to ripple. The atmosphere is moving that light around. Now, Venus is named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty. Although this planet's been observed as long as we have recorded history, Galileo, Galilei is technically the first one who observed Venus through a telescope way back in 1610. Venus is called Earth's sister planet. And for two main reasons that I'm aware of. One, it is a rocky planet like Earth, and it's almost as large as Earth. Its uh, distance, I should say, across is 7,521 miles, as opposed to 7,900 and change for Earth. So Venus is just a little bit smaller. Now, while this shape and size might be slightly similar, the two planets really start to diverge away from each other. Venus is not a hospitable planet. Its atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid. In fact, when we tried to land probes there, Russia landed that one on the surface of Venus, it didn't last very long because acid started to dissolve the poor probe. So we're still trying to figure out how we might be able to get something to the surface. Speaking of surface, what do you think of 872 degrees Fahrenheit? Venus is technically the hottest planet in the, in the solar system, and I should say in our home solar system. How could it be so hot? Well, it's because of that carbon dioxide. It has what's called the greenhouse effect. So when light shines in from the sun, that energy is held into the atmosphere, thus raising the temperature. So even though Mercury is the closest planet, Venus is the one that's hottest. Before this moves away, I need to adjust my 
little view there. I want you to be able to keep seeing that live view. Now, how about the day on Venus? The day on Venus is actually quite long. It takes 243 Earth days just for Venus to spin around once. Meanwhile, an, a year is a little bit faster. Our year, 365 and a quarter days. For Venus, it's 225 Earth days. By the way, this little temperature thing here, I know it can be hard to see these tiny little planets, but this thermometer, there's Venus at the top, here's Mercury, and then way down here, poor Pluto would be the closest or the, the coldest, even though it's not technically a planet anymore. Venus is fascinating to scientists and we still have lots to learn. Recently, two new missions were scheduled to actually go out to Venus. One of them is called Da Vinci Plus, and it stands for Deep Atmosphere, Venus, Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry, and Imaging, quite the acronym. That's slated to launch about 2000, or I should say 2026. Meanwhile, the other mission is called Veritas, which by the way means truth. Veritas stands for Venus Emissivity Radio Science INSAR, which is an acronym within an acronym. SAR means in situ. Uh, actually, I'm not sure what that means, so I'm not going to try that one. Scratch that. I'll look that up and have it in the chat. Uh, but let me start over. Venus Emissivity Radio Science INSAR Topography and Spectroscopy. True, quite the acronyms. That's later for 2028 and 2030. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, John, while I look up that acronym. Thanks, Brian. I think it is so weird how Venus, a day on Venus is longer than a year on Venus. That's really weird. Anyway, let's put on our thinking caps because we have our first round of trivia questions coming up to see what do you know about the orbits of the planets? Is it on? Yes, and now we are here uh, for the first round of trivia question. Um, question number one, do you think all the solar system planets orbit in the same plane? So it's a yes, no question and um, put your answer into the chat. And you feel that's a little bit too easy. Um, here's another tier for you. Either it's yes or no, why do you think that is the case? So maybe needs a little bit of explanation and rationale. Um, but again, put it in the chat and later we will have Jazz to reveal the answer. Okay, now we're gonna go outside again. And this time we're gonna look at probably the most beautiful planet there is. At least a lot of people share that view. And Amanda is gonna take us and show us just how beautiful it is. Amanda. Thanks, John. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I'm a graduate student at UC Riverside. I primarily study galaxy clusters with the Hubble Space Telescope, but today we're going to be using Stone Edge Observatory um, to look at Saturn. So before I get started, I just wanted to show you what the observatory looked like. It's a half a meter mirror uh, in a remote observatory in Sonoma, California. So we only access it remotely via Slack and you'll see that in a second. Um, and if you wanted to look inside of it, this is what it looks like. Uh, so let me turn the lights on so that you guys can see what it looks like inside. Um, and I'm remotely accessing it from Chicago. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I'll turn them back off before we start observing. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned that we're going to be using a Slack interface to look at Saturn. So let me tell you a little bit about Saturn while I get this Slack interface working. Um, so it is a half a meter telescope, which means Saturn is just gonna look like a very bright blob on the image, but I'll show you an image that I've reduced already uh, that you can see the rings better and everything like that. So this is our Slack interface that we'll be using to observe Saturn. Uh, Saturn is known as the jewel of the solar system. It's sort of one of those astronomical objects that is in the strange regime where we already know so much about it, but it still holds so many mysteries. And the same can probably be said for most of the planets in the solar system, like Brian was talking about earlier. Um, so before I go on, let me actually image it. So the way we image it is by typing image 
let's do 0 0.01 seconds because it's so bright. Um, you're going to be very underwhelmed, but that's okay. <laughs> In a very narrow band filter. So while that comes up and I'll show you for a second what it looks like here and then I'll actually switch to the image that looks nicer. Um, so it is obtaining the image and it's actually the farthest planet that we can see with the naked eye, which would explain why uh, it's been documented for over millennia. Okay, so here's this underwhelming picture of Saturn that is super overexposed. So let me show you uh, in the image that I've already processed uh, in DS9 and play with the range a little bit. So same telescope, but now that I changed the range, you can actually see the rings really nicely. Um, Saturn is a massive ball, which is mainly made of hydrogen and helium. It's a gas giant. And actually, since it is a gas giant, if you had a giant bathtub filled with water, it would actually float in the water, which I think is pretty crazy. Um, and there's quite a lot of history. So the oldest written records that document Saturn are attributed to the Syrians who described it as a sparkle in the night and named it the Star of Nineveh. In 1610, uh, you may have heard of the scientist Galileo Galilei uh, that Brian also spoke about, and he spotted, he's an important guy, clearly, uh, he spotted Saturn's rings through a telescope, but he mistaked them for a triple planet. Um, and only 50 years later, by around 1665, Christian Huggins discovered the first known uh, brightest moon of Saturn, Titan. So Saturn has 53 moons, but let me show you some of them right now. So if you change the range a little bit, and I already did this, um, where Saturn looks super bright, you can actually see the moons pop up and I've labeled them for you. So Titan, which is the one Christian Huggins discovered first, uh, you can see that it's the brightest. And then you have Rhea, Dione, Tethys, and Enceladus. Um, so we can see five of Saturn's brightest moons here, uh, but it actually has around 53 moons with 29 awaiting confirmation. So Saturn has been important throughout history, but it's also important in current research as well. So 1980, a flyby of Saturn, uh, Voyager 1, revealed the intricate details of Saturn's rings, which consisted of thousands of ringlets. And flying even closer to Saturn in 1981, Voyager 2 provided even more details and images about the thinness of some of the rings. And they're actually just made out of ice particles and dust. In 2017, so most recently in the news, Cassini, which was specifically designed to look at Saturn and study Saturn, and ended a 13-year orbital mission with a, quote, spectacular planned plunge into Saturn's atmosphere and sent science data back to the very last second. Um, so Cassini's final five orbits enabled the scientists to directly sample Saturn's atmosphere for the first time, which is really cool. So it's kind of crazy to know that we've been looking at this planet for so long, but we haven't actually been able to see up close to it until recently. Um, so I wanted to end my presentation uh, by sharing something, a personal story. So Saturn is actually very meaningful to me um, as an astronomer because... It is the first planet, it is the first thing that I've ever seen through a telescope. And here is that picture over here. Um, I, so I looked through a telescope for the first time in college uh, because I'm from New York originally. And I always say that the closest thing you see to a star uh, in New York City is a helicopter. So the first time I looked through a telescope has been at Yerkes Observatory. And when I saw this picture of Saturn, it just totally blew me away. It both humbled me and made me feel grand at the same time. Um, the telescope is really huge. That's what it looks like. It's a refracting telescope at Yerkes. And you can see that it's hard to move and heavy. And here's just a picture I took of the observatory. So Yerkes is really cool. If you ever get the chance to visit it, definitely do. Um, it's also a really important place where people like Hubble went. So here is, or where people like Hubble observed. So here's an old picture of Hubble there. Um, so yeah, Saturn's just been really important in my journey as well. And I thought I would share that with you. Um, so I hope that inspired you to sort of visit an observatory or go to the RAS events that these wonderful people put on, um, because maybe you'll be inspired there as well. Well, for sure you will. Back to you, John. 
Thank you, Amanda. That was great. So one interesting piece of trivia, I mean, my man had mentioned how the, the Riverside Astronomical Society, we do these things. We go and set up our telescopes out in parking lots and have people come and take a look. And almost without fail, when we're showing Saturn, people accuse us of chicanery. They say that we're putting pictures or stickers of Saturn at the end of our telescopes and because it looks so good. It's amazing. Anyway, You've had some time to think now about those questions that Sanan gave, such as, what do you know about the orbital paths of the planets? So Jessica is gonna tell us about it. Jessica? Yes, so um, I did notice that there were a lot of people in the chat that said, no, the planets do not all orbit on the same plane. And you're partially correct. So let me share my screen and we will see why. So, yes, for the most part, the planets do orbit on the same plane, with the exception of the dwarf planet Pluto and the planet Mercury. Um, they're highly inclined orbits, Mercury having about a seven degree incline and Pluto having about a 17 degree incline, could have been caused by either interactions with other objects or even collisions with other objects. So why do most planets orbit on the same plane? And the answer to this is the conservation of angular momentum. Now, angular momentum is a property that is related to the rotation or the spin of an object. When a rotating object changes its shape, its angular momentum remains constant, either speeding up or slowing down, depending on how the shape of the object has changed. So if we think about a spinning a figure skater, um, starting first with their arms out, spinning slowly, as they bring their arms in, they start spinning faster. And this is due to the momentum wanting to maintain the same value. But how does this apply to the orbital plane of the solar system? So the solar system originally formed from a rotating cloud of gas. And as gravity caused the cloud to flatten and collapse, the spinning got a bit faster. In other words, as it changed shape, this angular momentum wanted to remain constant as it flattened. And eventually it flattened into a disk, a very rapidly rotating disk relative to the original speed of the cloud. And it is from this flattened disk that the planets were able to form and maintained that angular momentum in their orbits. And for the most part, they still remain there today. So um, yeah, back to you, John. All right, thank you, Jess. Okay, it's my favorite time of the night. Maybe it's yours as well. Time for your bedtime story. The story, the title of our story tonight is The Circuitous Story of Planet Hunting in the Solar System, otherwise known as The Strange Story of Pluto. For thousands of years, people have lain awake at night gazing at the stars. They imagined they saw figures in the stars like whales, scorpions, dragons. And those things remained the same year after year after year. Almost all the stars did not move in relation to one another. But there were five stars, however, that slowly wandered around the night sky, their positions changing over time. These stars were given the name planet, which means wanderer. The first five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, could all be seen with the naked eye. As we know now, there are more than five planets, and some of the planets that are just so far away and so dim that people needed telescopes to be able to see them. But telescopes were not invented until about 400 years ago. In 1781, um, 100 years, 180 years after the invention of telescopes, William Herschel discovered Uranus. It was the first planet discovered in recorded history. However, the movement of Uranus through the sky seemed not quite right to astronomers who speculated that there must be another big celestial object out there whose gravity was tugging on Uranus. An English astronomer and a French mathematician therefore did some calculations and predicted 
where this mystery planet must be. Sure enough, when a German astronomer named Johann Gell aimed his telescope at the point in the sky where the mystery planet was predicted to be, there it was. And that is how Neptune was discovered in 1846. At this point, our solar system had eight planets. End of story. Or was it? Astronomers were puzzled by the large gap between Jupiter and Mars for a long time. And they figured there must be a planet in there somewhere. So they went planet hunting. And sure enough, Ceres was discovered in 1801. It was initially thought to be a planet. However, over the next 50 years, many similar objects with similar orbits were discovered. So astronomers reclassified Ceres from a planet to a new category of object known as asteroid. And that was how the asteroid belt was discovered. As astronomers continued to study Neptune, they were concerned that its orbital motions seemed a little bit off, as if there was another planet out there besides Uranus whose gravity was tugging on Neptune. And so the search for planet X began. 92 years ago, an American astronomer named Clyde Tomba began scanning the patch of the sky where planet X was be believed to be. After a year of searching, Tomba discovered Pluto in 1930. The discovery made headlines around the world. An 11-year-old English girl suggested that the new planet be named Pluto. Now our solar system had nine planets. End of story. Or was it? Pluto was an odd duck for a planet. Its orbit crosses the orbit of Neptune, such that every so often Pluto is actually closer to the sun than Neptune. In orbit is also highly inclined to the flat plane of the solar system. Pluto is very small compared to all the other planets. In fact, one of its moons, Charon, is almost as big as Pluto itself. It is so big that the two objects actually orbit around each other rather than Charon orbiting around Pluto. And just like how the asteroid belt was discovered 100 years before, several other objects were discovered out beyond Neptune, some of which are even bigger than Pluto. And that was how the Kuiper Belt was discovered. Now astronomers were facing a difficult uh, question. If Pluto is a planet, are all the objects in the Kuiper Belt bigger than Pluto also planets? In 2006, the International Astronomical Union met and created a definition of planet. This definition has three criteria. A planet must orbit the sun. It must have enough mass to have formed into a sphere. And it must be gravitationally dominant enough to have cleared its orbit of com comparably sized bodies. This third criterion is where Pluto fell short. But because Pluto met the first two criteria, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. Ceres was reclassified again. It is a dwarf planet as well. And once again, our solar system has eight planets along with five dwarf planets thrown into the mix for good measure. End of story. Or is it? All Love right. that story. <laughs> okay, well, we've been inside for a long time. Let's go back outside again. And this time we're gonna look at the biggest, the brightest, the most spectacular celestial object that's out there. And Manny's gonna show it to us. All right, thank you, John. So hi everyone, my name is Manny Lines. I am a retired aerospace engineer and member of the Riverside Astronomical Society. 
And uh, this time I'm coming to you live from my backyard here in Chino Hills, which is in Southern California. So tonight I will be sharing with you some live video of the moon, which I'm capturing with this small telescope here that is sitting behind me, not the Northern Lights, my small telescope. And uh, the pictures are actually being taken by my 11 year old uh, DSLR camera. So for those of you that are big fans of the moon and how can you not be, be sure to go back and check out our virtual outreach video from January 21st of this year on YouTube, where we did a deep dive into the moon. It'll provide a lot more information about some of the sites that I'll show you tonight. But without further ado, then let's go and let's take a look at the moon. So this is a live view of the moon that uh, is being taken by my camera. So uh, I should probably uh, say that this is not video. This is, uh, this, these are photographs. And so I'm gonna take a quick photograph here once again. And there we go. So um, let's go to the next uh, slide here. So on any given night, the most interesting features on the moon can be seen along the moon's day-night boundary, which we call the terminator. And that's because it's here that the sun is low in the moon's sky. And so it casts long shadows that help us see better contrast. So tonight we're gonna to take a brief tour of the terminator. So the first thing you'll notice are two major dark areas, and these are called Maria. And the, the one that, uh, that, that word dates from a time when the plains on the moon were thought to be seas. But now we know that they're dry, airless lava plains that were formed billions of years ago when the moon was young by the impact from asteroids. So the larger of the Maria is uh, called Mar Imbrium, and it is right here. Uh, it is, Mar Imbrium means the sea of clouds. It's the second largest of the Maria and one of the largest craters in the solar system. So you can see this, this edge here. The crater was formed by a massive uh, asteroid impact. I believe it was about 155 miles in diameter. And that happened about 3.9 billion years ago. The smaller Mare down here in the Southern hemisphere is Mare Nubrium, Nubium, excuse me, or the Sea of Clouds. So uh, this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole of the moon. So we're a little bit on our side here. So before we embark on our tour, let's talk a bit about how the moon looks to us from night to night and how that affects um, and how that affects what you see on its surface. So let me flip back to my uh, slides. So here we go. So I'm, I'm sure many of you already know that the moon shows different phases, which is the amount of its surface that we see illuminated by the sun over the course of its 29 and a half day cycle as it orbits the earth. Sometimes we refer to that jokingly as the lunar moon. Anyway, you may have heard of the terms waxing when the moon is proceeding toward its full phase and waning when it's past its full phase and heading toward new. And you've probably also heard of uh, the crescent phase here uh, when last the, uh, less than half the surface, uh, half of the surface is illuminated. But did you know that when the moon is more than half illuminated, we call that gibbous, that's a gibbous moon. So tonight, we have an eight day old waxing gibbous moon. So you can use that one to impress your friends. Now, if we were to speed up the lunar phases, collapsing the entire 29 and a half days into just a few seconds, what would we see? Well, it would look something like this. We would see the terminator, the, the moon's day night boundary sweep across its surface, but we would see something else interesting. The moon always shows us basically the same side, but you'll notice there's a sort of wobble which occurs because its axis is tilted slightly relative to the plane of the orbit. This makes the moon's north and south poles alternately tip slightly toward and away from us as the moon moves uh, through its orbit. Uh, we can also see around the edges a little bit at, during those times, and astronomers call these wobbles librations. So the moon gets bigger and smaller because its orbit is slightly elliptical, and so uh, when it is closer, that's when we have what is called a supermoon. So let's now go back to a live view of the moon, and uh, let me let me go back there, take another snapshot. So we'll return to the moon and notice the two seas that we talked about earlier. 
So bordering Mare Imbrium to the north is a broad range of mountains um, here that is called uh, that are called the Alps. And also right in the mountains embedded, you'll see the, uh, the large crater Plato, which is named after the famous uh, philosopher. Uh, and it is, of course, much darker than its surroundings because it's filled with lava. Sometime after the impact, it filled up with lava. And it looks oval, but it's really circular because it's so far to the north. So bordering Mare Imbrium to the south is a mountain range called the, the Apennines, named after the mountains in Italy. And below them is a huge crater right here, right on the Terminator called Copernicus. And uh, Copernicus was flooded, it was not flooded, excuse me, the lava area around it was. Uh, but notice the difference with uh, Copernicus here, which is hard to tell because it's on the Terminator and Plato. If in a couple of days, Copernicus will be much lighter than, than Plato. So south of Copernicus is the crater Reinhold, also on the Terminator. And there are Apollo 12 and Apollo 14, the landing sites uh, of two of the previous missions. So we'll leave the plains now and go into the, the, uh, uh, the rough country of the moon, the, uh, the, the uh, southern highlands. And here we find the crater Clavius, which is uh, right down here. It's, it's very, right there actually, it's very old. Uh, and then the crater, crater Tycho here, much, much newer, much younger, and does not have these embedded, uh, uh, embedded uh, craters within it. So the highlands are actually a target for future missions. Uh, the Artemis mission, the first one, if you've uh, heard about that, will be coming uh, to you in about two or three years and will land in the Southern Highlands. Uh, the reason is because these, some of these areas on the surface are uh, on the surface, the edges of the crater are, um, are perpetually sunlit. The craters themselves are perpetually, perpetually dark and therefore uh, have water ice in them. So uh, there are good resources there for the astronauts to use. So let me, uh, with that, we're running out of time. So I'm going to take us back and show you what we've been looking at here. Uh, this is the, uh, the surface of the moon and the objects that we've looked at. So I hope you enjoyed that whirlwind tour. And uh, I just want to remind you quickly about International uh, uh, Observe the Moon Night. And there's a web link there if you're interested. And it happens to be Saturday night. So uh, with that, I will send it back to you, John. Thank you, Manny. It's just beautiful. All right, so before we go outside, I want to take you know, kind of some of the things that Jessica was sharing with us before. This view of the solar system is kind of like a fried egg, right? You have this big yolky ball in the middle and it's surrounded on the surface of the frying pan is all the planets moving around in a big circle. And that is what our solar system looks like if you were standing above the stove cooking a fried egg. But what if you weren't cooking a fried egg? What if instead, uh, hold on a second, I'm trying to share something that I cannot find. Mm -hmm. Your computer's frozen. Anyway, let's forget about that. So when we go outside, we're gonna be, a, this is a part I'd like to call my naked eye gems. When you put your telescopes down and you don't worry about trying to zoom in really close on anything, rather you just kind of look up and enjoy the sky. And one of the cool things, because of this, this orange bar you see going across the sky from one side to the other, that's called the ecliptic. And that's the path through the sky that all the planets follow including the sun and the moon, because the solar system is flat for the most part, it rotates on a flat disk. So one of, the, one of the things that happens because of that is occasionally you've got planets and the moon all bunching up together. And that's what we're enjoying right now. So right here in the Southern sky, if you go out tonight and we're done and look up into the South, you'll find the moon, right? Which is pretty easy to find. And then you'll find just a little bit up and to the left of the moon is a very bright star which of course is not a star, that is Jupiter. And then over to upper right of the moon is Saturn, which is much dimmer, but you'll be able to see it. And those three things were all bunched up together. 
over in the western sky, which as our Venus will be already setting, and over in the eastern sky, Uranus and Neptune are they've just come up. So you go out tonight, naked eyes, no telescope needed, and find that group of stars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the moon all clustered together. But if you have binoculars, take your binoculars outside and check out the moon. And it'll look almost as good as what Manny was just showing you. If you hold it steady, you can actually see craters on the moon just with your binoculars. And if you turn your binoculars over to Jupiter, you'll see it's not a little point of light like a star. It actually has a disk. It actually has a diameter to it. And if you hold your binoculars really steady, you might be able to see one or two moons of Jupiter as well. So you don't need a telescope. And with that, let's check out some of the cool questions that have been coming up in comments in our chat room. What do we got? We actually had a lot of great questions and I'm gonna start uh, with the one from Bob Chow asking, uh, people often mention that Saturn would float in water, but would it also start dissolving? And I'll take that one soon on. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, the people use that that explanation of Saturn being uh, able to float on water to illustrate its density. Saturn's mostly gas, and it is actually the least dense planet in our solar system. But it's an example that can only be carried so far. If we tried to put that gas into the water, yes, it would essentially dissolve. But we're illustrating the fact that even though it's such a huge planet, its density is actually very, very low and really gaseous, much lower than water. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Brian. Um, next question is probably for Amanda um, during your presentation, that was. Um, so this one was from Stephen uh, Schreier. Asking, is the remote telescope equipped with adaptive optics? Is there any light pollution around the telescope? And also, thank you. Excellent presentation. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so the first question, is there adaptive optics? So not yet, but we have actually just gotten adaptive optics and we'll hopefully be installing it soon. Um, but, and hopefully the images will look a lot better after that. Um, the second question about light pollution, it is in Sonoma, California, which is pretty close to San Francisco. So there is some light pollution to the South, I guess. Um, but it's not horrible. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, next question is a still uh, from Stephen, and this one is a very interesting one, I personally find. Um, so he was asking, why was the planet Uranus named Uranus? Maybe astronomers are sitting on chairs for too many hours. Yeah, it's a very good question. I'll take that one also, Sunan. Yes, there is a reason why most of us in outreach will pronounce it Uranus. And that's just so that we avoid any other association with certain English words. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is, although Herschel is credited with discovering the planet Uranus, he did not name it that name. He actually called it Georgium Sidus after King George III. The name Uranus was proposed later by the German astronomer Johann Bode. And his proposal wanted to bring the name for this planet into conformity with the others that were named from classical mythology. So the name Uranus is Greek. This is the Greek god of the sky, who, according to Greek mythology, was the great grandfather of Ares and grandfather of Zeus. And so although it might have a similarity to English words, it's from a completely different language, which is where we get that name Uranus. Cool, thank you, Brian. And I also, um, I remember hearing something about, um, you know, they, they named the Saturn as the, the father of Jupiter, right? And then they uh, found um, Uranus, if you prefer pronouncing it that way. Um, and they're like, oh, we got to name this also the father of Saturn. So that's um, how they picked that name. That's what I heard, but you know, it's all um, along the lines of Greek mythology. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Cool. Um, next question from Catherine Kozier, asking how often do other planets' moons always show the same side to the planet, just like ours? I could take that one. 
So that's a great question. That, uh, uh, that uh, phenomenon of the one side being shown to the planet is what we call tidal locking. So we know that the, the moon uh, affects the tides, uh, ocean tides on the earth. And so imagine the moon, our moon and the earth pulling on each other. And so what is actually happening very slightly is both the earth and the moon are being turned into, into sort of footballs. And so when that, when that happens, you now have a, you have a heavy side of the moon, right? If the, if the moon is actually oblong, if the earth is oblong, that, that moon, uh, that, that side of the moon is going to want to stay pointed at the earth. So it's the earth's gravity that is actually pulling the surface of the earth uh, excuse me, the Earth's gravity is pulling the surface of the moon toward itself. And that is what's uh, causing the moon's one side to, to stay, stay locked to always facing the Earth. Now, I think your question was, do other moons uh, have exhibit that same phenomenon? And the answer is yes. As a matter of fact, pretty much every large moon in the solar system, any moon that has significant gravity it exhibits the same thing, including all the moons of uh, Jupiter and the moons of Saturn. They all they all do the same thing. And you heard uh, you heard uh, during the story tonight about uh, Pluto and Charon uh, and the fact that they orbit each other. Well, guess what? Uh, like two lovers, Pluto and Charon are always looking at each other. Not only as Char as Charon tidally uh, locked to Pluto. Pluto is tidally locked to Charon. And so they are looking at each other as they go around their orbit, mutual orbit for eternity. Thank you, Manny. Um, and uh, last question uh, for this session, also from uh, Stephen. Any comments about the increasing numbers of low Earth orbiting satellite constellations effects upon uh, astronomy research is international regulation needed. Um, so I could, you know, uh, share some some of my personal thoughts and feel free to, you know, add in here, everybody. Um, so I remember a few months ago, um, there was actually a journal paper um, announcing uh, the most distant uh, gamma ray burst ever found. Um, and that was at Redshift 11, which was only 400 million years after the, the Big Bang. So when the universe was extremely young. And um, so of course that was published on Nature and everyone was like super excited um, about the results. Although, you know, there was some uncertainties uh, that people were speculating, but that was okay. Um, and shortly after that paper was published and there were a lot of counter papers that came out and it turned out that um, instead of being a very distant, um, very energetic cosmic event, it might have been just reflected light from one of the passing by satellite. Um, and the other papers, the counter papers actually showed, um, uh, you know, the satellite um, would have entered the field of view of the telescope at that time when they took that, that uh, spectra or data. Um, so there were some solid arguments uh, saying and uh, saying that, you know, it was not a very distant event. Um, and also because there were already some speculations and uncertainties arguments associated with that. So I guess that could be something um, that we see a lot more happening in the future, just because, you know, at any point, if we point a telescope, especially doing um, astronomical research when you need a long exposure time, inevitably you're gonna have something fly into uh, your field of view and your data would just be completely contaminated. Um, so that's my personal view. Um, I feel international regulation is needed, but I don't know whether there will be um, such thing. I, I would just add quickly that that I, I wholeheartedly agree on the international regulation. And ever since the, the mega constellations such as Starlink and uh, OneWeb, I think is coming and others, there were literally um, SpaceX is intending to launch, I believe 14,000 satellites. And I think they just asked for permission to launch a bunch more. So as somebody who takes pictures of the night sky, I can tell you from personal experience 
that I would say the photographs that I take about a third to a half of them have a satellite trail in them. That's how many satellites are up there. And imagine a, a, these photographs are taking a picture of about a one degree uh, fleck of the sky. So smaller than your pinky on the sky. And yet I get a satellite about every other photograph. So it's a real thing. It's a real problem. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Benny. Um, so I guess that concludes um, our first check-in uh, for the live chat. And uh, now I will probably present uh, the second trivia question. Cool, all right. So our second question is about some smaller objects in the solar system. First one, do you think comets and asteroids have similar compositions? Or do you think they're roughly the same thing? So yes, no question. And if you want a little bit uh, more challenge, think of this one. What are they made of, respectively? So put your answers and thoughts into the chat, and later we will have Garrett to review the answer. All right, thank you. So while you're thinking about the asteroids and the comets, let's go outside once again with our telescopes. And this time I'm gonna check out the king of the planets, my favorite planet, Jupiter. Brian's joining us again with his telescope, no longer yes. on Venus. <laughs> yes, indeed, uh, Jupiter is my favorite as well. So here is a live view of Jupiter and we actually have a bonus. Keep your eye right here in this area. If you could see my pointer, just almost in the center, this is actually the shadow of Europa on the surface. And to show you a quick, quick diagram, Europa and Ganymede are off to the right. G Ganymede's blocked by my presentation, but the moon is visible here in the black, and that is a shadow being cast onto the surface. I think that's pretty darn cool. All right, back to the facts here. Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun. And as John mentioned, the king of the planets. He is by far the largest, but more on that in a moment. Now in the sky, Jupiter would be the third brightest uh, of the objects that is receiving light from the sun as a reflection. So we have the moon, Venus, and then Jupiter. Let's take a look at some more facts. Jupiter is named after the king of the gods, just like it's the king of the planets. That's from Roman mythology. Now, Jupiter is also, being as bright as it is, has been seen throughout antiquity. However, Galileo, again, is credited with first observing Jupiter through a telescope back in 1610. Now, unlike the other planet I discussed that was rock planet, Jupiter is a gas giant. And it is giant. It is more massive than two and a half times all the other planets in the solar system put together. You may have noticed that Saturn and Jupiter seem to be in a competition for moons. Well, Jupiter's latest score uh, from NASA is 79 moons. So that's 79 objects orbiting around this amazing planet. Now, what about the atmosphere for Jupiter? It is a gas giant. And I just need to scooch Jupiter just a little bit as the tracking is going off just a little bit here. All right. Now, after the Juno mission, we learned even more about Jupiter's atmosphere. It is primarily hydrogen and helium. You may recognize that as the primary ingredients currently in the sun also. What about the bands? Jupiter spins around remarkably fast and its bands are actually due to the fast rotation of that planet. They're primarily ammonia, ammonium, hydrosulfide, and water. Now, I mentioned the Juno mission. After this mission, scientists have started to study more about the effects in the atmosphere. They now believe that ammonium and water, I should say ammonia and water slush balls or mush balls fall as hail on this planet. So while we have hail that's water, Jupiter has hail that we think is ammonia and water. Pretty darn amazing. Now, you may have noticed the great red spot in many pictures. I have one here in the corner. The great red spot was first discovered or seen, I should say, back in the 17th century, which is the first record, again, of seeing it through a telescope. That is a gigantic storm that's, again, been around as long as we've been able to look at a magnified view of this planet. I mentioned how 
fast Jupiter spins around 10 hours. So our days, 24 hours on Jupiter, only 10 hours at spinning fast. Meanwhile, one year on Jupiter is 12 Earth years. Now, Jupiter, right, two and a half times all the planets in our solar system put together, it is so big, its gravity really wreaks havoc on our solar system. Not only does its gravity wreak havoc, but things tend to run into this planet. <clears throat> Back in 1994, scientists knew about a comet that was on its way too close to the planet. And Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 actually broke apart and then ran into the king of the planets. We were fortunately able to capture these views. So you can notice these bits flashing up here on the lower corner. Now, not too long ago, we're recording this on October 14th, 2021. Almost exactly a month ago, an unknown object collided with Jupiter. And it was actually captured by an amateur astronomer. This amateur astronomer was recording footage for a show not too different from ours. And he caught this flash on the planet. Scientists still aren't positive what this is, but we think it was either an asteroid or a comet. Pretty safe guess since that's the big things that are floating around. Now, I feel that no presentation on Jupiter is complete without seeing what Hubble has to say about this amazing planet. So here we have a view of Jupiter and Europa. See, Europa loves to photobomb <laughs> pictures of Jupiter. So here's a picture of Jupiter, and I specifically chose one that would give us a nice view of that red spot. This was captured August 25th, 2020. I just got to say again, Jupiter's amazing planet, wonderful in binoculars or telescopes. So get out and take a look as soon as you can. All right, back to you, John. All right, thank you very much. Now, you guys have been thinking, what do you know about asteroids? What do you know about comets? Let's see what Garrett knows. Thanks, thanks, John. Sorry, I'll mess up in here. Yeah, so uh, comets and asteroids actually do not have the similar compositions. Now, there are a lot of objects in our solar system, and some of them are sort of in between asteroids and comets. So there are some things that don't fit neatly into this. But generally, when you have, when we think of asteroids and we think of comets, we have very specific things in mind. Um, and these things do not have the same composition, but they are both leftovers from the formation of the solar system. Um, so how about comets? So comets have a rocky core and are made of ice, dust, and frozen gas. Um, so this is sort of the anatomy of a comet. Um, and we can see the, where the um, sort of iconic parts of the comet come from, so the tails. Um, it actually has two tails. So as it's going through, and as this, this ice ball gets closer to the sun, it heats up, and these, all this ice and dust um, end up getting blasted off of the, the comet and forming the tails. Um, so the dust tail, it comes from the radiation pressure um, from the sun um, and forms a, well, the long dusty tail that follows the, the path of the comet. There's also the ion tail, um, which will look a little bit different and usually be blue color. Um, that's from the, um, it gets blown off by, by the solar winds of the, by the solar winds. Um, so you see like when you look at a comet, you can oftentimes see two types of tails. See, it's really narrow ion tail, and it's really long and uh, puffy uh, dust tail. Um, and comets can be found very far away from the sun. So they form in very cold regions, so very far away. So out in the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt, out beyond the orbit of uh, Pluto. So very far away, very cold environments. What about asteroids? So asteroids can have a, a bit different compositions. They're always made of rocks and metals, but those rocks and metals can vary. Um, so the iron, as so we have iron asteroids that are 90% well, iron, uh, large and partially nickel, or we can have different kinds of things that have um, oxygen, silicon. So you have the silicate asteroid, um, but always, always rocks, always metals, just different kinds of rocks, different kinds of metals. Um, and the asteroid belts, where asteroids were found, are mainly in the asteroid belt. So this will be the asteroid belt right in between. Uh, Mars and Jupiter, that's where a lot of them are. Um, sorry. Um, and there's sometimes they get knocked off their orbit and are near Earth uh, orbit asteroids. That, that's the ones we mostly look for. Yeah. So
but that's hopefully you know, learned a little bit more about comets and asteroids. Thanks, Garrett. Okay, now, so far tonight, we've been staying in close to home. Oh, we're looking at visible things we can see with our naked eye, but we're seeing them with the help of telescopes. Now we're going far out into the solar system beyond what we can see with our naked eye. And that's where Randy's gonna come in, giving us not one, but two planets tonight. Yes, Go for and, Randy. Yeah, let me get going here and uh, do the share thing. You should be seeing a page that says the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. We see it. All right. The idea is how are you gonna find it? How can you find Uranus tonight? That'd be the first one. You can use a very good pair of binoculars. And I mean by a good pair, I mean something that's kind of big. These are kind that most people don't want because they're big and heavy. These are 50 millimeters across or about two inches. And something very important, you need a little bracket to put it onto a tripod. You need to study this thing. But you can see uh, both Uranus and Neptune using binoculars, but you will not see their disk. You can tell by their color. How would you see it tonight? Well, rising, well, it's actually been rising, but it, to, to be able to get out of the sort of the muck at the lower near the horizon, about 10 p.m. to about 6 a.m., you start looking in the southeast and it will cross over and uh, set, uh, get pretty low the, at 6 a.m. in the southwest. In between these two times, it'll be at its highest spot. Here is um, the head of the whale uh, is just right above, um, it's right above just uh, to the sort of northwest of it. It's actually in, the, uh, in part of the constellation Aries. Here's Pisces over here, here's Cetus over here, the whale, and uh, above that is Andromeda. Taurus over here. This kind of map here won't get you there. You have to have something a little bit more um, detailed. Uh, download something off the internet. You can usually find uh, something that'll help you out. If you want to see the actual disk, you're going to need something about a four inch telescope or better or bigger. Now, if you have a very good high quality uh, three inch, two inch, whatever, you probably could uh, see it. But they have to be extremely good optics being that small. Over in the corner here, you can see um, Uranus. It's frozen at the moment because it's enlarged. When I click on it, it'll get a little bit smaller and should drift across the sky, theoretically. There we go. There it is right here. And it'll start coming across. Now, I don't know if you can see the color makes it through to what you're seeing, but that is a light bluish, um, not quite so turquoise uh, this time, uh, color, but it is a disc. Uh, it is not a star pattern. The day and night on there is, a, is short, like Jupiter, but not quite as short. It's about 17 hours, which means if you're a kid going to school there, your school day is going to be about two thirds what a normal school day would be here. You want to become one year old on uh, Uranus, you're going to have to be 84 years old on the Earth. So some of your grandparents might just make it to one year old on Uranus or maybe a little older. Yeah, it's about 13 rings, a little bit brighter than uh, Neptune generally. And this planet is knocked over on its side. It is rolling through space. Let me go to the next picture here where we've got it. Okay, that's enlarged. And now here it is, more of a live picture. This is, it won't cross the screen. It's now guided and staying on this. Um, it was mentioned before that Uranus was uh, named after the goddess Saturn or, or grandfather of uh, Jupiter. Uh, another little kind of interesting tidbit, after it got its name Uranus, about nine years later or something, they named um, uh, uranium, the metal, the radioactive metal, after Uranus. Uh, and this planet has about 27 moons, and the big ones are, as was mentioned before, they're tidally locked. Let me go on to size comparison. Uh, if you wanted to see these plants, this is what we were looking at, this guy right here. But both of these guys are pretty far away. The Earth by comparison is about one fourth the size. Earth four Earths would, would fit across either one. Neptune's a slightly a little bit smaller. The great red spot on Jupiter that you just saw is uh, about maybe just a hair bigger than what you just saw with Neptune. 
And then, I mean, with Uranus, and then Neptune is kind of smaller. So here's your Uranus, here is Neptune. And so we're looking at some really small images. They're really not that small, but so why are they? So why do they look so small? Are they not these giants, you know, four times the size of the Earth? If you want to see Neptune, you're going to need probably a six-inch telescope or better. You can still use a good pair of binoculars. You might see a bluish color star or lightly uh, bluish color star. Uh, but uh, you want to see the disk, you're going to need a good six inch or bigger. Again, you're going to need a, a quality map. Right now, it's uh, in the constellation of Aquarius, just below the one of the head of the fish is in uh, Pisces. Um, here's another map of this. Again, you'll need something more detailed than what you see here. What does it look like? Well, this is it right here. You see it's quite a bit smaller and darker. It's lost a little bit of its color. It usually shows up a little bit bluer than this, but that's it as it, dry, as it kind of goes by. Again, the day and night is shorter. It's about 16 hours. And again, your school day would be about two thirds of it. Although I don't think too many people are gonna become one year old there because you'd have to be 165 years old here on the earth. It has rings, it has five rings and four ring arcs. Uh, and it's farthest away. It's 30 times farther than any, from the earth and the sun. Now, if you wanted to talk to somebody falling into the sun and they're complaining about how hot it's getting, it would take eight minutes for their message on the phone or message to you at the speed of light. If you want to do that with um, Neptune, it's going to take about four hours for your message to get out to Neptune. And if, assuming that they answer you right away, another four hours to get back to you round trip time, eight hours just to talk to somebody. Here is... Um, Let's go back to a guided one. Here we go. It's slightly enlarged. You can see that there is a disc. Uh, and I'll let it run. And this is guided right here. Now, both of these, these videos are not live because this one, I'd have to have the telescope out there about uh, probably about midnight to get a good view of it. And Uranus, uh, if I were to shoot Uranus when I first started this, I'd be looking just above the neighbor's house and it would be very disturbed by the heat coming off of the house. And probably a neighbor wouldn't like it if he saw me pointing a telescope right at his house. Let me go on to the next here. These, uh, this is all the information just kind of uh, relayed to you, but I like these pictures. This gives a pretty good rendition of the color and you can see maybe uh, what came through, the color was very much like this light blue. I have a video that I could add in, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. I took another movie player. I didn't change the color. All I did was in, in, increase the contrast a little bit and it kind of showed this blue a little bit better. I didn't want to change the color balance or anything because that would falsify the color, but it did kind of come out more like this. What do they both have? Well, they both have uh, faint rings. They have atmospheres of hydrogen, helium, and methane. Hydrogen, you know, from um, the old uh, Zeppelins that used to catch on fire and burn up before World War II. Helium, you know, out of balloons, it makes your voice squeaky. And methane, that's the gas that comes out of your stove if you have a gas stove. Uh, the methane is what gives these planets their bluish colors. The interior is a thick soup of water, ammonia, methane over an ice, mostly water ice, they believe, uh, uh, compressed over a rocky core. That's why they got their name, the ice giants. The earth, uh, if the earth was the size that give you kind of a representative model of a large apple, uh, then these two worlds be size of a basketball. So I would say the moral of the story is go take your basketball, paint it blue, whichever blue you want to use here, maybe draw a nice storm on the dark blue one and go outside and play basketball with Neptune or Uranus. And that's it. Turn it back over. Thank you, Randy. Okay, so before we wrap things up, let's go back to our chat room and see what kind of cool questions are coming from there. Great, um, yes, we do have some uh, good questions. Uh, first one is from N.D. Garcia, um, and this is actually asked uh, by Daniel, age nine. Um, what is the oldest planet in the solar system? Can you tell us um, on the show? Yes, we are. I could 
I could take that if you need it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Randy. Uh, they're just real in the brief. Uh, it's they're all about the same age because they're made out of the same material out of the, uh, the gas cloud of gas and dust, the primordial uh, uh, beginnings of our whole solar system. So they're really uh, made out of the same material at the same time. So they're really about all the same age. Yes, thank you, Randy. And um, to Daniel, if you remember what Jazz was presenting, um, all the uh, planets were actually formed when the entire giant cloud was thickened, uh, thinned into a flat disk. And that's why almost all the planets were um, formed at the same time. So basically repeating what Randy was saying. Um, cool, next question uh, from Ronald Ross asking, it looks like Jupiter didn't completely clear its orbit. There are Trojan asteroids, right? So does Jupiter actually satisfy the definition of planet? And I'll take that one. And it, uh, you make a very good point. And Alan Stern, the principal investigator for the New Horizons missions to Pluto, agrees with you. Um, so you're referring to Trojans. That is a series of objects that is in, uh, in orbit with Jupiter. And the International Astronomical Union, or IAU, they worked on this definition for planet. And one of their criteria was that the object should clear its orbit of any other objects. Well, the problem is Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Neptune also have not cleared their orbital neighborhoods. So that definition does not quite work. But we need to keep in mind that planet really means wanderer. And many people are starting to advocate for a completely different definition for the objects up in the sky. But for now, this criteria does hold and scientists are, are debating heavily what criteria should actually consider a planet to be, um, I guess, to consider an object to be a planet. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Brian. And just quickly add to that, I also did a little bit Google search. Um, so the total mass of those Trojan asteroids um, that share the same orbit of Jupiter, that um, actually comes down to about a tenth of a thousandth. So one over 10,000 of Earth's mass. And we know Jupiter is about uh, 300 uh, times more massive than Earth. So, you know, those objects uh, are not actually comparable in either size or mass. And that's why we consider it as cleared. But, you know, for um, Pluto and objects in the Kuiper Belt, they are more comparable um, in size and mass. Great. Um, next question from uh, Bodhi, five years old, asking, why does Saturn have icy rings around it? Uh, thanks, Jinan, and thanks, Bodhi. That's a great question. Um, so there's, I hear two parts to this question. The first is maybe why does Saturn have rings? And that's because uh, those rings could have been formed from various different processes, things like when the planet was forming, the dust and the rock just didn't collapse uh, into the main ball of the planet. Uh, the other thing that it could be is just things that collided with Saturn, uh, things, they're basically pieces of comets, asteroids, or shattered moons that collided with uh, Saturn. So it's just stuff that has been colliding with Saturn. Um, and it's icy because, so the second part of the question, it's icy uh, because it's really cold on Saturn. So around negative 285 degrees Fahrenheit on average, which apparently you can look up on the weather channel, like weather.com. So I thought that was pretty fun. Uh, but yeah, it's really cold and that's why they're icy. And great question. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and our next question is from uh, B. Han asking, is there a particular stargazing app most recommended by the pros for lay persons to use? So John, I wonder if you wanna show again <laughs> what you were using. Yeah, so that's one of the things I do when we finish with our show, as we're getting to wrap up, which we are getting ready to wrap up, there's a series of uh, resources, both for your phone, for your computer, for you know, to read with your eyes and your, the book. And I'll be talking about that in a couple of minutes, so stay tuned. Okay, cool. Um, last question uh, from Valentina uh, Venagas asking, uh, why are some planets made of gas and others rocks and metals? Those are really, really great questions. Um, 
So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so when uh, the solar system was forming, um, we are still talking about a flattened disk around, uh, you know, the central star, which is our sun at a very early stage. So that disk um, actually has um, different temperatures at different locations. So the closer it is to the sun, the hotter it is. Um, and it was actually hot enough, actually way too hot for some ice and gas to condense and consolidate to form planets. So that's why all the inner planets are sort of rocky, smaller, just because um, all the materials that were able to condense were actually just metals and rocks um, because all the volatiles are still in gaseous phase and wouldn't um, just fall onto um, a planet or planetesimal. But as you move out outwards, um, the, plant, the temperature drops and then the, the gas, either they're you know, colder or they're in um, a, a, a solid state as ice, then they could be picked up and actually um, get combined with the other sort of like rocky and uh, metallic materials to form either gas giants or um, ice giants. So that's why even Jupiter and Saturn, they have a rocky core, a very small rocky core that they are able to um, attract a lot of gas. Um, so they have thick atmospheres. And that's also the same um, for Uranus and uh, Neptune. So they also have rocky cores. So I hope that uh, answers your question. And that was all the Q&A for the panel. So John, should, I, should, should you go ahead or I go ahead? for the plugs. Let's go, let me go first. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of time for us to, to wrap things up. Um, and what I wanna do is put a little plug in, not just for my astronomy club, but all astronomy clubs. If you're still with us at this time, then you're probably pretty interested in astronomy. And probably no matter where you live, there's other people who are interested in astronomy not too far away. And there might well be an astronomy club nearby as well. So the Riverside Astronomical Society, we've got a couple hundred people that in the Southern California area that think astronomy is cool. So if you think astronomy is cool, you should check us out. We have some pretty cool activities that we do, a pretty you know, lecture series. We have a dark sky site out in the desert where it's really dark and you can see the Milky Way and all that kind of stuff. But there's, milk, there's astronomy clubs all over the place. So keep an eye out for them if you are interested in such a thing. And then also, to kind of go back to the earlier question about apps and such. So Stellarium is a free program you can download from the internet onto your computer. And that's what I was showing you earlier tonight when we were talking about the ecliptic and where Jupiter and Saturn are and such. That was Stellarium. It's what's called a planetarium program free of charge. You can put it on your phone, you can put it on your tablet. If you want to have a Chromebook, you can go out onto the web and use it at the website. So it's pretty cool. And then there's Sky Safari. That's one of my favorites. That's a, an app that is good on Apple as well as Android. Uh, it's good for tablets, good for phones. You can control telescopes with it. it it's pretty cool. And then leaving the world of ele electronics, we have, well, sort of leaving the world of electronics bridging the world of electronics and, and paper, skymaps.com is a terrific website where you can go every month and download a free map of the sky, what's going on that month in the sky. Where's Jupiter that month? You know, where's the moon going to be on the fifth? And so you take, you print that map out, go outside with the little red flashlight and you can find all kinds of cool things in the sky. And then there's astronomy magazines. Okay. If you want to keep current and what's the latest and the greatest in terms of research and, and discoveries in, in astronomy, check out some of the magazines. There's a couple here, Sky and Telescope, an astronomy magazine. You can pick them up at Barnes and Noble, you can get them online, you can subscribe to them, right? And then if you want a good old fashioned book, you can sit there and sit it on your lap, Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. It's a terrific book, it's an introduction to, into the hobby and the science of astronomy, it has whole sections on how to choose a telescope. It's a great book. And if you're kind of a younger person out there listening to us, A Child's Introduction to the Night Sky by Michael Driscoll, that's a terrific book, again, for introducing kids to what is astronomy, what are telescopes, all that kind of stuff. 
So yeah, there's a lot of great resources. I probably went through more than two dozen apps for my phone. Try it, throw it away, try it, throw it away, try it. Oh, this one's good. I'll keep it. Um, so it all depends on kind of which ones you're going to like best. Cool. Well, thanks, John. And now it's my turn to actually advertise um, UCR Astronomy a little bit. Um, and I might just use the, okay. Um, sorry, let me change it right here. Yeah, so there are several ways uh, to actually follow us. Um, we have a Facebook page um, called Astronomy UC Riverside and the name is um, Astro UCR. Uh, you could simply just like us or follow us. And this is where we're gonna post all the future events as soon as we schedule it. And as you notice next Thursday, we're actually going to have a public um, astronomy lecture also on uh, YouTube about planetary defense. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how those um, asteroids are gonna potentially impact uh, the earth. So this is one way. And we also have another um, community outreach page by the department. And I will copy this link in the chat just in a moment. And here you could also see um, all the upcoming um, outreach events scheduled. Uh, and I guess aside from that, um, you, know, you could also choose to sign up um, for our email list, which will be included, the link will be included um, in the survey that I'll be sending out um, when soliciting your feedback. So multiple ways and um, yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed our show and I'm gonna um, put the links in the chat and maybe this is also time for us to do the raffle. Wait, wait. Yes, if you're still- I forgot still to mention. <laughs> No. no worries. If you're still here, now is your time to okay, enter. So, <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, okay. Okay. I just, again, the Riverside Astronomical Society, we've got two events coming up, one tomorrow and one on Saturday. So if you're in the Southern California area, the Inland Empire, we're going to be at the city of Norco tomorrow night um, at the George Ingalls Equestrian Center. And then on Saturday night, we'll be at the shops at Dos Lagos, the shopping mall in Corona. So if you're in the area, Swing on by, the weather looks like it's gonna be great. And uh, we'll be able to show you the things we showed you tonight, but you'll be able to see them with your own eyes. Photons from Saturn hitting you in the head. It's cool. Thank you, John. Um, so while people are filling out the raffles, should I just move um, and make this personal announcement? Go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so I wanted to um, let everybody know um, that I have uh, accepted uh, a different job um, so in Northern California. So I will be leaving UCR at the end of November. Um, and I am, well, I'm trying to hold myself together so I don't cry. Um, I've been spending a lot of great time here um, with the department and with this um, team. So I truly appreciate um, your enthusiasm and your support and your interest. And it's been a lovely journey um, having you all at uh, our virtual events, especially you know, during this special time. Um, moving forward, we will, um, I will try to find a successor to take over my role at uh, UCR to keep to try to keep this kind of a virtual engagement going. And um, while the plans are still up in the air, we will keep everyone uh, posted through all the channels that I just talked about. So just to stay tuned. Um, and again, this is uh, my last stargazing event with uh, the RAS, but hopefully my new role will also be outreach focused. So hopefully um, in the future, we will have some kind of new collaboration with the RAS and uh, UCR Astronomy. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, thank you everyone. And um, I will definitely miss everybody. You're the best, Sanan. <sighs> you guys are the best. Um, so I guess that uh, sort of concludes our show today, right? Yep, remember to fill out your, your forms so you can win the book. I think we're gonna give away like three of them, I think. So your chances are good. Yeah, 
or maybe even a, a little bit more depending on how, how many people fill it out. Um, so great. Well, uh, thanks again, everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. Um, I will be sending you a survey form tomorrow, um, just collecting your feedback and comments on our show. Uh, but aside from that, uh, we hope you enjoy it and do hope to see you again next time. All right. Bye. Take care.